he who travels alone travels the furthest. So for a long time in my career, I wasn't looking to attach myself with a relationship or anything like that. I was just, you know, I had ambitions that I wanted to fulfill and that's what I went and did, you know. Somebody made a hundred million dollars and now don't have to talk to that artist or none of their crew, don't have to validate none of their contracts. And that's when he said, Mama, you've been blackballed. And I said, well, why have I been blackballed? And he said, because you didn't play the game. And I said, what game is that? And he was never able to answer that question. Russell Crowe has hinted that he may never return to Hollywood again. And this news might just sit well with Monique and Cat Williams, who could see it as a wise decision. So what exactly is going on? Russell Crowe hasn't set foot in the US for filming since 2019. The star of Gladiator, who now splits his time between his farm in Nana Glen, Australia, and his Sydney apartment, explained that his American friends often question his absence from the US post-pandemic. My American friends are like, what's going on? he said during an interview on Two Day FM's Hugh Is the Ed and Aaron Breakfast Show. Between 1992 and 2019, there wasn't a single year when the actor didn't make at least two trips to the US. However, after his last film in the US, the thriller Unhinged, the pandemic struck. I haven't been back since for a press tour, he explained. I've been able to wrangle a way to do most of the press sitting here on the phone on the farm. Over the past four years, Crow has filmed in Thailand, Malta, England, Ireland, and Australia. Now in 2023, he revealed that he was was considering winding up his career. At the 57th Karlovy Vary International Film Festival in Karlovy Vary, Czech Republic, he shared that he's contemplating retirement, according to Variety. You are standing in front of the mirror and go, who the F is that? He told journalists at the festival. I am in that period now. Crow weighed up his options, mentioning 85-year-old director Ridley Scott as an example of continuing to work as he ages. I will take Ridley Scott as my role model. He is still discovering new things in his work, Crow continued, or I will just stop and you will never hear from me again. These are two very valid choices. Fans were shocked by Russell's words because, let's be real, Russell has definitely made a name for himself in the industry. Russell Ira Crow was born in Strathmore Park, a suburb of Wellington, New Zealand, on the 7th of April, 1964. At the tender age of four, his family embarked on a journey across the Tasman Sea, bound for the sun-soaked shores of Sydney, Australia. It was here, amidst the bustling streets and vibrant culture, that Crow's love affair with the world of cinema began to blossom. His parents, drawn to the allure of the film industry, pursued career careers in film set catering, immersing young Russell in the captivating world of show business from an early age. As fate would have it, Crow's path to stardom was paved with serendipitous encounters. A chance opportunity arose when, at the age of five or six, he found himself sharing the screen with none other than the esteemed Jack Thompson in an episode of the Australian TV series Spy Force. Little did he know that this would mark the beginning of his illustrious journey into the world of acting. Education beckoned, and Crow's formative years saw him traversing the halls of Vaucluse Public School and Sydney Boys High School. But it was his return to the shores of New Zealand in 1978 that would shape his destiny. Continuing his schooling at Auckland Grammar School and Mount Roscoe Grammar School, Crow's passion for the performing arts burned bright, eclipsing all other pursuits. At the age of 16, Crow made the audacious decision to abandon formal education, opting instead to pursue his acting ambitions with unwavering determination. Guided by his friend and mentor, Tom Sharplin, he embarked on a musical odyssey in the early 1980s, adopting the stage name Russ LaRock. Despite releasing several singles in his native New Zealand, commercial success remained elusive. Undeterred, Crow sought solace in the vibrant music scene, managing a popular music venue in Auckland, and immersing himself in the rhythms of the city. But fate, it seemed, had other plans for the aspiring actor. Australia beckoned once more, and at the age of 21, Crow returned to the land down under, his sights set on the prestigious National Institute of Dramatic Art, NIDA. However, destiny intervened in the form of a fateful encounter with a mentor who recognized his innate talent and advised him against formal training. Armed with nothing but raw talent and unwavering determination, Crow set out to conquer the stage and screen on his own terms. Professional opportunities soon followed, with Crow landing his first major role in a New Zealand production of the Rocky Horror Show, directed by Daniel Abenary. His portrayal of Eddie Dr. Scott earned him critical acclaim and set the stage for a burgeoning career in the performing arts. From there, Crow's star continued to rise, with notable roles in stage productions such as Bad Boy Johnny and The Prophets of Doom and Blood Brothers. But it was his foray into the world of film that truly solidified Crow's status as a rising star. His breakout role came in the form of the 1992 film Romper Stomper, in which he portrayed the charismatic and complex leader of a racist skinhead group in suburban Melbourne. 
Directed by Jeffrey Wright, the film catapulted Crow into the spotlight and earned him widespread acclaim, including an Australian Film Institute AFI, award for Best Actor. Buoyed by the success of Romper Stomper, Crow's career continued to flourish, with roles in a string of critically acclaimed films such as Proof, The Sum of Us, and The Quick and the Dead. However, it was his performance in the 2000 epic historical drama Gladiator that truly cemented his status as a Hollywood heavyweight. Directed by Ridley Scott, the film catapulted Crow to international superstardom and earned him an Academy Award for Best Actor. From there, Crow's career reached new heights, with acclaimed performances in films such as A Beautiful Mind, Louisiana, Confidential, and Master and Commander, The Far Side of the World. Despite the accolades and adulation, Crow remained grounded, always striving to challenge himself and push the boundaries of his craft. In recent years, Crow has continued to captivate audiences with his diverse range of roles, from the biographical drama Cinderella Man to the epic fantasy adventure Noah. With each role, he continues to captivate audiences, solidifying his place as one of cinema's most enduring talents. And now, in the latest chapter of his illustrious career, he brings to life the famed exorcist Farter Gabriele Amorth in The Pope's Exorcist, further showcasing his versatility and mastery of the craft. But why would Russell give up such a successful career? Well, according to Cat Williams, the only people who last long in Hollywood are those who conform to its standards. And one such person, according to Cat, is Kevin Hart. For context, in a recent interview on Club Shay Shay, the legendary comedian Cat Williams made waves by expressing his candid views on fellow comedian Kevin Hart. Williams, known for his unapologetic style and fearless commentary, delved into the dynamics of Hollywood Hollywood and the comedy industry. His statements brought attention to Hart's rapid rise to stardom and questioned the authenticity of the comedic landscape. Cat Williams began by highlighting the astonishing trajectory of Kevin Hart's career in Hollywood by first questioning the unprecedented speed with which Hart achieved success. In 15 years in Hollywood, no one in Hollywood has a memory of going to a sold-out Kevin Hart show, there being a line for him ever getting a standing ovation at any well, comedy club. Williams went on and suggested that Hart's rapid ascent was unusual and posed the question of whether Hart had truly paid his dues in the competitive world of stand-up comedy. The comedian emphasized the significance of the journey and questioned whether Hart's seemingly instant success was indicative of a different narrative. He already had his deals when he got here. Have we heard of a comedian that came to LA and in his first year in LA he had his own sitcom on network television and had his own movie called Soul Plane that he was leading? No. In the interview, Cat Williams introduced the term plant to describe someone who seemingly appears out of nowhere and attains success without the traditional struggles that comedians often face and then claims they are self-made. Williams then drew attention to the fact that Kevin Hart's documentary with Chris Rock revealed his comedy roots on the East Coast. He pointed to a perceived contradiction in Hart's narrative, noting, he just did his documentary with Chris Rock, where he shows you that his whole upbringing in comedy was on the East Coast. So how, simultaneously, was he here in Los Angeles doing the same thing? It didn't happen. Williams probed into the inconsistencies in Hart's story, challenging the widely accepted narrative of an overnight success. Additionally, Williams also went further to reveal the things that Kevin Hart and other comedians have done in order to be accepted as A-list celebrities. He revealed that he had a tense encounter with Martin Lawrence, who tried to make him wear a dress for a movie role. Williams said that he was offered a part in Lawrence's film Big Mama's House 2, but he turned it down when he found out that he had to dress up as a woman. He claimed that Lawrence was not happy with his decision and tried to pressure him into doing it. He said, come on, man, it's just comedy. It's not that serious. It's not like you're really a woman. I said, no, man, I'm not doing it. I have principles and I have dignity. I don't want to disrespect myself or my people. He said, well, well, you're missing out on a big opportunity. You could be a star. I said, I'm already a star. I don't need to wear a dress to be funny. Williams said that he respects Lawrence as a comedian and an actor, but he does not agree with his choice of wearing dresses for laughs. He said that he believes that Hollywood has an agenda to emasculate black men and make them look weak and foolish. I'm not saying that every black man who wears a dress is selling out, but I'm saying that there is a pattern and a purpose behind it. They want to make us look like clowns and buffoons. They want to take away our masculinity and our power. They want to make us lose our identity and our self-respect. Williams said that he is not afraid to speak his mind and stand up for what he believes in, even if it means losing some fans or some money. He said that he is proud of who he is and what he does, 
and will never compromise his integrity for fame or fortune. I'm not here to please everybody. I'm here to tell the truth and make people laugh. I'm here to be myself and be original. I'm here to be Cat Williams, not somebody else's puppet. In any case, the dress matter has been a subject close to Williams' heart since he believes it is Hollywood's way of emasculating black comedians. You see, Cat has a long history of calling out Hollywood elites and their shady ways of controlling black celebrities. In a 2013 interview with Black Tree TV, while discussing his role in Scary Movie 5, Cat delved into some interesting topics, including a theory about black actors being forced to wear dresses on screen in order to progress to the next level of fame. It's worth noting that this interview came out not long after Kevin Hart appeared on an SNL skit wearing a dress. For context, it all started when Dave Chappelle, another revered comedian, appeared on Oprah's show in 2006 where he talked openly about his refusal to accept a $50 million deal from Comedy Central. He felt that such deals came with strings attached and he was unwilling to be controlled or humiliated for the sake of a paycheck. Chappelle's revelations didn't end there. He recounted being asked to wear a dress for a movie scene, an experience that left him deeply uncomfortable. According to him, many comedians had faced similar situations, having to don dresses on screen, and it often coincided with a critical juncture in their careers. This too was a nod to the prevailing industry belief that black entertainers needed to cross this peculiar threshold to advance. Fast forward to 2012, when Kevin Hart was asked about Dave Chappelle's claims during a radio show. While he didn't explicitly say no to ever wearing a dress, Hart emphasized the importance of personal boundaries. He stated that crossing these boundaries boundaries was non-negotiable for him. You have to have you have to have boundaries, you have to have limits that you refuse to cross. He even cited examples of bizarre requests he had received, such as dribbling a basketball on a talk show, which he politely declined. Hart stressed the importance of protecting his brand and the potential risks of compromising it. However, just a year later, Hart appeared in an SNL skit where he donned a dress, a move that drew sharp criticism from fans. Some accused him of being a sellout, arguing that he had contradicted his earlier stance. The skit portrayed him as a nine-year-old child pope, an image that many believed didn't align with the Kevin Hart they had come to know. The new Pope is nine-year-old Oscar nominee, Kevenshene Wallace. Cat Williams seized this opportunity to reignite the feud. He suggested that Kevin Hart's actions on SNL were merely part of a larger pattern, insinuating that Hart was willingly playing by the industry's rules to secure fame and fortune. Williams opined that Hart's success allowed him to escape criticism for wearing a dress, as a long line of comedians had already done so before him. At the end of the day, Kevin doesn't have to worry about what people are gonna say about him wearing a dress because of the long line of dress wearing people before him. He pointed to movies like Big Mama's House and the Medea franchise as examples of previous instances where comedians had donned dresses. Another person who has experienced just how evil the industry can be is Monique. Mo has had the longest beef with Hollywood elites, which is still going on to date. For context, this beef started after the release of the 2009 movie Precious, produced by Oprah and Tyler Perry and directed by Lee Daniels. Monique received widespread acclaim for her incredible performance and won the Oscar for Best Supporting Actress. Since Monique's performance created so much buzz, Oprah and Tyler asked her to go on a press tour to promote the film. However, here's the kicker, they didn't want to pay her for this. So, Monique declined, explaining that she'd rather spend time with her husband and kids after putting in so much effort into Precious. According to Monique, as soon as she said no to Oprah and Tyler Perry, headlines started popping up, painting her as difficult and impossible to work with. With. Right after Precious hit screens, Monique watched as several roles that came her way suddenly vanished into thin air. Hollywood seemed to have slammed its door shut on her. Monique later told The Hollywood Reporter that Lee Daniels admitted she was being blackballed. When she asked him why, Daniels responded, because you didn't play the game. However, when Monique asked Daniels to explain what game he was talking about, he didn't know what to say. But we can all guess what the game is. They were basically sending a message that all black entertainers need to worship the ground Oprah walks on and never say anything negative about her or else. However, Monique didn't let them silence her. In a 2015 interview with THR, Monique alleged that the movie director blackballed her from working in Hollywood, also leveling similar claims at Perry and Winfrey, who she's still on the outs with, claiming they aided in the effort. One of the networks said to Lee that I was really difficult to work with, Monique said at the time. Whoever those people are who say Monique is difficult, those people are either heartless, ruthless, or treat people like they're 
worthless. And that's unacceptable. I come from a blue collar town. And being from that place, you learn not to let anybody take advantage of you. You don't let people mistreat you. You stand up for what's right. In any case, we can't say for certain if Kat and Monique's claims mirror what's driving Russell Crowe to contemplate a Hollywood exit. But if they do, then fans shouldn't be too quick to throw shade his way. In Tinseltown, it's no secret that survival sometimes means playing by the industry's shady rules, and Crow might just be tired of the drama. Anyway, that's it for this video, folks. Bye.